are you a diver and you maybe even take photos or videos underwater, then this live stream is for you. Because we believe that everyone who takes images underwater is already an ocean ambassador. And to make sure that you can do your job properly and inspire people out there to care for the ocean and eventually protect it, we collected your questions beforehand on social media and we're going to ask those questions to creative professionals from the industry. And we are sending live from the world largest water sports show here in Düsseldorf, the boat show, which is taking place from 18th to 26th of January. You're going to find us live in Hall 11 at the Pixel World workshop stage. Make sure you follow us on social media, on the Behind the Mask Facebook page and on the Behind the Mask YouTube channel. Turn on your notifications and most importantly, ask your questions down in the comments and maybe we will even be able to pick up your question and forward your question to our guest. And one more thing, by leaving us a comment, you already have a chance to win amazing prizes. So, hello everyone, we are back, it's two o'clock and we've been waiting for that moment for a long time because we always get the questions, hey guys, you have amazing expensive camera gear, but what do I do if I can't afford it or if I'm just starting out and doing something, can I do something with my smaller camera or with a compact camera and therefore there is only one guy that is the right guy to ask and to basically cut loose talking about compact cameras and everything related to easy workflows and beginner settings. Welcome, Tim. It's a real honor. Yeah. I know you are a rare animal on these kind of uh, stages. I'm the rare species in this environment. <laughs> <no>? <laughs> yes, but you have a very interesting concept with what you do and your philosophy is. What are you doing there in Anilao in the Philippines? Um, many years ago when I got to Anilao, I went there to shoot and just take pictures by myself. And eventually people started to ask me, you know, can I come and learn? And I decided that this would be a good base to actually get people to learn how to take pictures. So what has developed over the last seven years is we've actually come to a school setup where people can come and stay at the place and learn photography. We use really good guides. We've got some good rules about uh, guides being good spotters and not being hands-on and stuff like that. And at night we review the pictures and customers all sit together and they share knowledge. So what I do in Anilao is I generally run this place where people come and develop their photography skills. Photography more than videography. Yeah? From the beginning, like from a ve like you can go there if you have no uh, experience yes. at all and you just think maybe this is something that would, could interest me, yep. you are the guy that will take them by the hand and show them what they need to know. Well, what, what has actually developed over the years is people who like photography from a TG a uh, simple compact setup. They, they go to a shop and they say, now I want to go further. So the shop sells them a lot of stuff and they say that if you want to learn how to use all this, you go and look for this guy. <laughs> so I have people coming and saying that here's all the gear that I've just bought. I've been told you're the guy to show me how to use it. So we start off from this is a port. This is how it goes on the camera. This is the camera and how it goes in. And we take it all the way to professional levels. People who have learned the basics, they go out and shoot, they come back, they want to go further and they go all the way until many are already standing on stages doing workshops now. So the, the, the journey is quite, quite a long one. Yeah. And what are you showing us today? <clears throat> well, I wanted to actually show the simplicity of how things are. So when I was invited to come and share some information. I wanted to show that it doesn't cost 5,000 to 10,000 US dollars or euro to get onto this journey. I mean, everyone has to start somewhere and you don't go to the shop and say, give me the best one in yeah. the market. I want to learn how to take pictures. No, people always want to start small. So I want to show the, the two small systems that are available in the market today in the compact camera world. Yeah, so I've brought a simple one, which is very popular today, the Olympus TG series, it does not have a manual mode. And then I've also brought a compact camera, which is a bit more um, advanced, that has a manual mode. And in the next 30 minutes, I was hoping to actually get as much information out there. Perfect. 
to be able to actually have a 30 minute reference point for someone who's just bought the camera from the shop and wants to go back home and say, so how does this work? I think very often people actually, they, they go to the shop, they buy the camera and they're very excited. So when they come back, they take out the camera, they put in the battery, they put it in the housing and they're ready to go diving. But I think there's a lot more that needs to be done before you come to that level. And I would like to do in 30 minutes, a quick run through as to what's important and the few steps that are involved in taking pictures with a compact camera. And it applies not only to these two models, it's something that you can basically, if you have a compact yes. camera, you can find the same sort of settings That's also correct. on other models. Generally, the compact camera world today, they are the, the point and shoot with no manual and then the ones with manual. So the ones with no manual are very simple. They've got the Canon ISIS series, the Olympus yeah. TG series. Then when you move up to the ones with the manual, you've got the Canon G series, you've got the Sony RX series, and you've got the Olympus XZ series in the past. So these are across the board, the same range of cameras that, that will apply mm -hmm. to everyone in the same range. Okay. Yeah. And just to, just to be clear, you obviously still need a housing to bring them in the water, right? That's true. Yeah. But uh, this is how you basically set the camera up and can understand a compact camera, what we are hearing now. I, I think to come here and show you how to put a camera in a housing would be a waste of this 30 minutes yeah. because this <laughs> I, one... I mean, you never know, you know, maybe <laughs> somebody, you know, you know, is very I've, new I've, and doesn't had know people, that you actually need a housing. I've had people fly into Manila and said, I've flown in here with boxes and I don't know how to put them together. Yikes. I will pay for all your expenses to come to Manila and help me to put it together. And I've had this before, but I think putting a compact camera into a housing is more straightforward than a big DSLR yeah. system. So putting it into the housing, you can read the manual for simple systems like this. But I wanted to go a little bit more into <clears throat> the knowledge that you need to operate these systems. Okay. So let, let's start. I would like to start off by saying I believe the most important thing in taking pictures, be it a point and shoot, a compact camera with manual or DSLR, the most important one rule is to know your equipment. You know, you can't take a camera and put it into a housing and go diving and expect to have good pictures. You need to know how the system works and exactly where the buttons are. So fortunately, there are a lot of things that can be done to customize the, the interface to suit you. So familiarizing yourself with the buttons in each camera, I believe this is a very, very important, wow, we have it there. Very important part of actual photography. Um, maybe we start off by looking at a few s settings. I've actually connected this to the camera, uh, to the screen now. So people can actually also follow through and see what I'm doing on. This is live footage from the camera? Yeah. Perfect. But this also allows me to actually show you stuff like this, what's in the camera. Excellent. So we can walk you through and see what's really important. Um, getting yourself very familiar with your system is important. Um, you need to know what exactly needs to be done. So if I'm going to press the, the quick menu here, these are things that generally will pop up on your screen whenever you are taking pictures. Now, on this camera that I'm using right now, I'm actually on the auto mode. So by pressing the quick menu, you can actually see there's not a lot of things that it allows you to change. You know, it allows you to see whether you want to shoot RAW or JPEG, uh, video, timer, the size of the photo. But that's about all you can actually do on auto. Now, moving down to the next mode, is when we shoot it on the program mode. Program mode is like auto. It chooses the aperture and the shutter speed for you. But if you press the quick menu here, you will be able to see that you're actually allowed to change the ISO that you want, work on the white balance that you want, metering, uh, the focus, whether you want it to be facial focus or whether you want it to be auto focus on a single spot, whether you want it to be shooting one photo or whether you want it to be constantly focusing. This is the servo where it focuses and focuses for focusing on moving subjects. I, by the way, I'm using a Canon G7X Mark II uh, as a demonstration, but this will be generally the same even if you use a Sony RX. You can actually see the, the size of the photos. And looking at the compact camera, I believe the 3x2 is actually the biggest. You can actually see 
by putting it at 16 by 9, I'm shooting a 17 megapixel photo. Then if I go to 3.2, I'm shooting a 20 megapixel photo. If I'm doing 4.3, I'm shooting an 18 megapixel. So obviously, when you're shooting, you want to get the biggest one. Yeah. Because the bigger the size, then you can crop it down and come to the 4 by 3 later on if you want to. And it is using the whole sensor that is in there for yes. this mode? Okay. Yeah. And then you've got the RAW on the JPEG. Uh, very often, I like to use both when we're shooting. And then ND filter and timer. So this is on the P mode. And then you've got the aperture mode, which allows you to choose the aperture. So very quickly, I, I, I think a lot of people don't use the T, the, the speed mode, the aperture mode very often. But I think this is a very good one for constant light. Yeah. So generally, if you're shooting on the A mode, all you need to do is choose the aperture you want. And the camera will choose the shutter speed for you. If you look on the lower left screen, if I'm shooting f1.8 and I half press it, the camera yeah. decides 1 over 80 is the best one for me. And then if I increase my aperture to 2.8 and I half press, now he's choosing a 60. So it does a lot of the work for you as you're shooting using the A mode. Yeah? So if I went on to 4, it will get slower. <coughs> Let's get the ISO up to, let's say, 200. This will be very slow now. And finally, we got the M mode, the manual mode where you are taking full control of the camera. So people need to know what all these things are for. Yeah, I think what I actually encounter a lot is people getting the camera and then asking, what settings are you using? Putting two numbers in and hoping for the best. <laughs> so what I'd like to do today is to actually show people how these few different Excellent. modes work. Um, let's take you all the way up to the P first and start. Somebody did ask a little bit about custom white balancing. So when I do custom white balancing on my photos, I do often use the P mode. You press this down. ISO, quick, quick example. If I use the smallest ISO and take this picture, let me take it for you now. So that's picture on the lowest ISO. And then if I chose the highest ISO, that would be the picture. So using the ISO to look at the pictures, you can see the, the, the quality of finish here. Yeah. This is a big number ISO. And this is a small number ISO. You can see how nice the finish is when you're using the smaller numbers yeah. compared to the big number. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah, so we're talking about compact camera and the briefing today. So I think a lot of people who use the compact camera are not as, as, as advanced. So if I were to explain mm -hmm. this to you, you said, oh, Tim, oh, show me something that I don't know. But a lot of people really do not know. So mm -hmm. choosing the smaller ISO is always going to give you the better quality finish. Yeah, using a small ISO gives you a nice finish like this and a big ISO number will give you a finish like this. So you always want to use a smaller number to get the best quality of the photo. Now, let me take you into the white balancing. Many people are also not familiar with the white balancing. White balancing in auto, if I shot this here, auto means the camera will try to sense what kind of ambient light is going on here and it will try to adjust it to give you the best outcome. But when it goes underwater, the camera starts to lose understanding about why is everything this color. So you can put lights on to be able to bring the colors back on, but very often you can also use the camera. And today, you can change ISO here. For example, if I were to take a picture of this orange and tell the camera later, okay, that's orange. I go into the menu on the G7X and I tell the camera, custom white balance. So when I go into this menu, he will ask me, is this white? And I will say, yes, it is white. Now, I have set the white balance, but I also need to now tell the camera to please use the custom, not the auto. So this is done by going into the Q set or the quick menu. And from here, telling the camera to use the custom white balance that I used earlier. Look at the chair now. 
<laughs> yeah. So now the chair, as far as the camera is concerned, knows it's white because I told the camera this is actually white. So if I take a picture now, look at the sofa. It's as white as it can be. But when I shift it around, it's all blue. And this is generally how the white balance works underwater because if you're underwater and you are 20 meters and you shoot a white colored t-shirt, the camera will show you this t-shirt is actually blue, right? That's why everything is blue. So you can tell the camera, camera, this is not blue, this is actually white. So what the camera will do is it will eliminate this layer of blue from the image and from that point forth everything is the right color so if you went and shot um, a person wearing a white glove like this his glove will first look white swim over to him take a picture of the glove go back into the menu and tell the camera hey camera by the way this is not supposed to be blue it's supposed to be white he will remove the blue from there then you go away and you take that photo and it will be back to good colors again. This is something that so little people use today. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so unusual that people use the custom white balance. But the custom white balance, look, if I went and took a picture of this red, I, I just take a random picture. And then I tell the camera now, hey camera, This is actually supposed to be white. Okay. Now let's look at the chair again. Well, this is as white as it can be. He's taken away as yeah. much as he can. And now the pictures all look like this. So this is how you custom white balance. You are able to tell the camera that this level of blue or level of green that you're seeing in the image is not meant to be there. And he will eliminate this. Do you have to do this on different depths? Yes. Do you have to do it like, yes. is it changing? It is changing all the time because, I mean, the blue that you have when you're shooting a white slate at five meters, it's very little blue. The white slate will look light blue. Then when you go to 10 meters, the slate will look darker blue. And when you're at 30 meters, this slate is blue. So as you go deeper, camera needs to constantly be reminded, remove this blue, remove this blue, remove this blue, remove this blue, and it will yield a good picture. So, I mean, Canons do this job really fantastically. Sony's do a decent job. Um, but if you're down at 30 meters, custom white balance and shooting a, a rack, the rack will be colorful. They will not be a blue rack as uh, most, most times we do. And most people, they accept this, no? And they say, since there are no colors, I need to buy strobes. So when you do throw the strobes, then you light it up again because you've now using white light to drown out the blue. But if you actually tell the camera to remove the blue, you have nice pictures and nice colors again. So that's the use of the white balance to answer one question. And I use this very often when I'm shooting on natural light. That means I don't use any lights, yeah? Um, maybe I can do this one more time for you. Slight, a good example. Okay, so now, I'm going to put this red light here and I'm going to use white right there. So, let me take you back to auto white balance first so you see what it's actually going to look like. <coughs> this is how the picture will actually look like because I have a red light. Yeah, a bit red. Now, I'm going to take a picture with this red light and tell the camera Ooh. okay even with the red light I'm going to take this picture and then now I'm going to tell the camera that's not supposed to be red that's supposed to be white so I go back into custom white balance and I tell the camera this is supposed to be white okay get out go back to custom white balance and you can see even yeah. with my red light shining on the same thing now we are back to the correct colors again yeah. that means my nudie branch will also be the right color despite me having a red light shining on it
Yeah, so mm -hmm. this is how you actually get colors out and the use of custom white balance is very, very effective today. Um, quick, quick explanation is back in the day, in the 70s and the 80s when they were using film, you cannot do this. Yeah, you cannot change ISO also on film. The ISO is fixed by the film that you buy. So today in the digital age, there's so many things that the camera is capable of doing that if I actually went underwater with only this camera and a housing and nothing else, I can still produce pictures of competition quality. I can. I am able to remove colors. I'm able to change my ISO. I'm able to do so much. Uh, so the capability of the compacts today are really good, yeah? OK. So now that's P. Now I would like to take you a little deeper. Are you okay? Are you falling asleep yet, Flo? No, no I think so it's very interesting. <laughs> I just don't dare to ask any question because yeah. I think it will be pretty stupid question. No, no, no. There are no stupid questions. I mean, you cannot believe the questions I answer on a daily basis. <laughs> so I have come to realize that there are no stupid questions. <laughs> just questions that people really cannot figure out. So we give them the answer. Okay, so that's the P. P mode is when the camera chooses the aperture and the shutter speed for you and you are able to tell the camera what ISO you wish it to use. So, um, let me take you down to metering. Still on the P mode, let's not go to A yet. On the metering mode, you see, your exposure of the picture on P, A, and speed, aperture mode, program mode, or speed mode, the brightness or the darkness is actually controlled by the exposure value that you want the camera to give you. This is it. This is the exposure value. It goes from a plus to a minus. So if I were to tell this camera now, this nudie branch here, I have told the camera that I want to use a small ISO, okay? And I told him to use auto white balance. I've told him to use the single autofocus. And now I say, take this picture. Let me put it on macro. Take this picture and he will take this picture for me. This is what the camera has shot for me on exposure zero. If I turn the wheel on top, you can see it gets darker, darker. As I go towards the minus, it gets darker and darker. Yeah? So this is the controlling factor. You don't have to worry about the shutter speed or the aperture. The camera will choose what it wants to do for you based on the given instruction that you have told the camera, I want it to be minus one. When, want, when do you uh, change the <coughs> exposure uh, well, like this? In, is there some certain okay. you know, situations that you need to do that? Zero is the given, right? Zero yeah. is what the camera believes is right. So when you put it on auto, he always shoots to exposure value zero. But let's say I take a picture of this nudie branch now. Do you not think that the exposure is a little bit bright? Yes, I think yeah. so. Yeah. That's when we say, okay, I think it's too bright. Let's take it down. Now, it's a bit darker, yeah. but this seems better. Yeah. yeah. So the exposure value is the controlling factor when you're shooting on program mode, aperture mode, or shutter speed mode. You don't have to worry too much about the settings. You just tell the camera how dark or how bright you want it, and he will do it for you. So, um, going back to this one, this will tell you, your camera will ask you, you want minus one, where? Do you want minus one on, a sp on the spot where you put the focus is? Or do you want minus one for the general photo? So, if you say for the general photo, then he will find the highest, the brightest point and the darkest point and make it minus one in between. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But if you tell him I want minus one only on the new D, so let's see, I put this here and now minus one only on the new D. Okay? Versus minus one on the overall screen. Let's look at the comparison. So this is minus all, generally minus one. And this is minus one on the subject. Generally minus one, minus one on the subject. It will choose for you minus one where. Mm -hmm. So 
if I'm using this system, let's say for example, I use the spot, okay? So this is minus one on the spot. And then I use a torch light, which is sharp. Like this. Minus one, let's go to minus one on the spot. Oops. Now I'm going to put a sharp hard light on the new D. Now you have your black background. And you, I'm not even touching the camera. The camera is doing, because the camera is sensing that I want minus one, and I put my focus there, so he's going to give me minus one there. So if I did, let's say, I want to go even darker, and I go to minus two, and I put my light here, there you go. <laughs> you don't see any more. It's done. The camera is done. So I'm not even touching the camera now, is he? It's pretty cool. I put the light there, and I shoot the picture. That's my, <laughs> that's my black background. I don't even need to do anything. I didn't think of the aperture. I didn't think of the shutter speed. I didn't think of anything. The camera is now analyzing the light that I have put there. And he's giving me my black background. Okay? Mm -hmm. But if I say I want it to be across the board, so I'm doing this one. Now, the nudie is going to be very white and the dark is going to be very dark. So he's going to try to meet a compromise. So I will not get a very good black background here. Yeah. Yeah? Same setting. Just yeah. telling the camera what's important to me. Okay, look. There we go. This is the spot. And this is the evaluative. Mm. All right. So that's using P. If we use A mode, what's really important about the A mode is, of course, the aperture people always explain. Big hole, small hole. In reality, this is not important at all. No? What's really important with the aperture is how much is in focus. So when people choose the A mode and they are explaining it to somebody, they say, oh, if you use a small number, the hole is very big. If you use a big number, the hole is very small. This is not important. Think of the aperture as the smaller number, less in focus. And as you increase the number, you get more and more and more in focus. So if you have two, if I'm shooting this one now, let's just play with it. I'm going to take my, I've gone to aperture mode, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm going to make the aperture 2.0 and I'm going to try and focus on this new D. Okay. If I focus 1.8 on this new D, do you see how the background looks like? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's 1.8. So what happens if I increase the number now to 2.8? Okay, 2.8. Then I increase the number to 4.0. And then I increase the number to 8.0. I can already start to read what's yeah. behind, yeah? And I increase the number to 11. Now let's look at the pictures now. This is F11. Look at the background. Yeah, everything is kind of in focus yeah. almost. This is 8. This is 4. <laughs> this is 2.8. And this is 1.8. Who cares if the hole is big or the hole is small? <laughs> it doesn't matter. All that matters really is by changing the F number, more is in focus and less is in focus. So if I want 1.8, I have very little. Maybe only the nudie branch head is in focus. And if I go 2.8, maybe half the nudie branch is in focus. And if I go 4.0, a little bit of the background starts to be clear. If I do 8, even the crinoid behind the nudie branch is clear. And then if I do 11, the diver in the background is also clear. So when you choose your F, it doesn't matter big hole or small hole. How much do you want in focus? So if I were to take this picture of this new D branch example, 
this is my mission. I've gone out on the dive and I've seen this 3D branch. The first thing I do is, do I want to see the back or not? And I think, okay, I want a little bit of depth of field, so let's just go with this and show you. Let's go with the 2.8, yeah? This is the F2.8. I'm on minus 2 exposure value now. So the camera will always choose the shutter speed to give me minus 2. I choose the depth of field that I want, and I tell the camera I want it dark. The shutter speed will be chosen by the camera. I don't have to worry about it. All I need to do is, hey, this camera makes me look fat, nah? I don't know. You're yeah, yeah, good. yeah. I should. You're good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's look at this. I'm going to use a broad beam now. This is a broad beam. Now, I'm going to tell the camera I want it to be spot evaluative. And I'm going to tell the camera I want minus one. So now look what happens when I have my light here and a half press. Look at the shutter speed. It's chosen 800 for me. Now, if I bring my light closer, look at my shutter speed. I'm not changing the shutter speed. The camera is doing it for me. That's my picture. Yeah? Now, if I use the sharp beam and I only wanted to light up the nudie branch, so I light up the nudie branch there. Oops. That's your snoot shot. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, Not let's bad. say, for example, I want more depth of field and I'm going up to 8. And I put the light there again. So that's your snoot shot. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I didn't have to do anything with the shutter speed. I didn't have to go and make mistakes. By allowing the camera to handle one element for you, like in this case, the camera is choosing the shutter speed, or if I use the other way, the camera can control the aperture for me. But by doing this, there are no mistakes. It's always minus two. So let me show you this. My light is so far away. The new D branch is exposure value minus two. And he chose for me a shutter speed of 50. When I move my light closer, my new D branch is still minus 2. He's giving me 200 now. And if I move my shutter speed even nearer, he's choosing a shutter speed of 1,000 for me now, but still minus 2. So you don't make mistakes. Because you have told the camera, I want minus 2. And then you put your light, and he will always do the right thing to give you minus 2. Simple, you know? Yeah. So exactly. people, people tend to always jump to manual so quickly that they, they don't realize that constant light actually works best with the aperture mode because step one, you choose the depth of field you want. Step two, you put the light there and tell the camera what exposure value you want and click and it's done. There are no too bright, too dark, too bright, too dark, too bright, too dark, none. Always minus two. Camera always makes the right decision for you. Is minus two something that you prefer to? I, I work with uh, the region of minus one mostly. Yeah. Why is why is that? Just to preserve any highlights. Yes. Yeah. If it is a bit dark, you can fix this on the computer. But if it's a bit bright, you can, it's hard to get it back. So you always want to get a little bit darker, and you don't want a little bit brighter. Darker you can do. Brighter difficult to manage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's using the A mode. Now, oh, okay. <laughs> Let's take you to the M mode. Now, this M mode is a is something that people are so afraid of. So, if just give me a random aperture. Pick one, Flo. Four point zero. Four point zero. So, if I go to four point four point zero on the aperture, 
it gets brighter the smaller the number yeah gets darker so we are choosing 4.0 shutter speed also it's 1 over 50 of a second this is 1 over 100 of a second and if you go all the way to the end this is that's bright one second so do we want a black background yes 4.0 black background no problem boss <laughs> we turn the shutter speed we turn 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 that's black yeah yeah we turn it until it's black and then we put the light there your black your black background how difficult is that it's very easy but people always so afraid and so unsure about how the camera works there's nothing complicated about the camera if i said i wanted to do it on f 11 okay so if I make it slower, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And if you look on the exposure value meter, he's actually showing you where you are. Oh, okay. So if I turn this shutter speed, he's yeah, telling me where I am. So this would be zero, but it's 0 0.3 of one second. And if I keep turning it, turn it until it's black, It's black. Then we put the light. Finish. Nothing difficult about it. It's just a matter of understanding. When you use your aperture, tuning it one way gets brighter and the other way gets darker. If you use your shutter speed, tuning it one way is darker and the other way is brighter. Now find your balance. There is no rule. You can use 8 and then tune your shutter. You can use 4 and then tune your shutter. You can use 2.8 and tune your shutter. It's up to you. But so it's going to change the background. Sorry? But it's going to change the yes. blur of the background. Yes. Yeah. But if you're doing black background, it's not really a problem. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Now, <laughs> people ask me about wide angle. So how do you do this setting for wide angle? Now, the setting for wide angle is actually not difficult. If I were to shoot this now, Imagine this nudie branch is sitting on a rock and then this is the this is the blue ambience in the background. So again I will choose the aperture that I want and I think I will work somewhere in the middle. Let's say four. Then I will put my frame. Let me show you, yeah? I will move my frame to shoot this close focus wide angle here. Now do I have a nice blue in the background? There's no point shooting wide angle if you're going to shoot wide angle with a black background, no? So what do I do? I wanted F4. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to... Make the shutter slower. Just tune until I like the background. Ah, the background is nice now. But is my nudie nice? It's not. Not yet, no. So my nudie branch now, look at it, it's a bit bright. I move my light further back. Until it's nice. Now I have the background that I want in the right tone that I like. And I've adjusted my light for the nudie branch. So setting the camera is for the background and setting the light is for the nudie branch. Simple. So the concept is that you have a compact camera and a light? Yes. For you photos, like continuous yeah. light for photos. You don't even use a flash. You don't really need, need the flash, you don't. Yeah? But let's, let's say I want to use a flash. So I'm not using the constant light now. So <coughs> let's say I'm on manual. I'm going to tune, tune it until it's black. Okay, it's quite dark. Now what I'm going to do is, I need to light this, but I don't have a torch. So I'm going to use my internal flash. Okay, once I turn up the flash, 
it doesn't show me now my settings anymore. So yeah. you would tune it with the flash off mm -hmm. and then pop up the flash. And now I'm going to just randomly take one photo first. It's good. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> There, that's my PDF. I mean, there's nothing difficult about it at all. Having the stroke allows you to put it in a better position. But many people have a compact camera with no strobe, so okay, you have an internal flash, use it. Yeah? So, mm. let's say, for example, I wanted to shoot <coughs> really, really 2000 and F9. All right? If I turn this off, it's pitch black. I can't even see my hand anymore. Now I'm going to turn on the flash and shoot my hand. Not bright enough? No. Press the flash button and turn the wheel. Watch on, watch on, no, sorry. Press the flash button and turn this wheel. Do you see? On the right hand side, medium, large, medium, small. So small was not enough, now I go for medium. Good? Yep, I would say, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Yep. Black background. Why? Because without the flash, it's black. So I need a light to light up my hand to give me this swimming jellyfish with a lot of blue water in the background, but black. It's not hard, no? It's very simple. Maybe we stop and ask any questions first. If, uh, yeah, I, can I ask one? Yeah, 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 you, you go ahead. <laughs> so I think from the stuff that we do, we sometimes neglect the fact that technology, especially for these point of shoots, are so advanced. Very advanced. Everything that you've described here, Mm. If I wanted to go underwater right now okay. and have this set up with the housing, yep. how much is that costing me? You can, you can start with $1,000, so American $1, dollars. You should have a decent setup, a decent camera with a simple housing <coughs> with a torch that can do quite a bit. That's, that's okay. Now, I would like to, <coughs> on this same camera, cover one more element. I think it's very important that uh, people understand what the diopters are for. Yeah, it's important. So, are we still on? The can I? Yeah, should be on. Oh, they've cut me off already. <laughs> no, we're not cutting you off. Don't worry. Okay. So, now with with this this, I'm gonna go back to A. Yeah, because aperture mode, I don't need to worry about too much. I only tell the camera I want it at minus one and I want to use F4. Now, if I want to take a picture of this nudie branch really close up, I would like to zoom it. So look, I've zoomed it all the way now. If I half press, my camera can no longer focus. So, where am I? Oh, where's the nudie branch? The branch. Okay. Oh, there we go. So, I can't even focus here. Oh, I can. Still okay. Now look at the distance I am from the nudie branch. It's about a foot, one foot away. It can focus at one foot away. Yeah? This is on full zoom. But if I don't zoom it, I can focus it here. So why would I zoom it? and move further back when I can actually be without this. But if this is not big enough, let me try and actually get this picture. Okay. Not big enough. Look at the nudie branch and look at the frame. Yep. So the better way to do this would be for me to zoom it all the way in. But this makes me have to focus from this distance. 
And this is why we need a diopter, because by having a diopter, this is a CMC, which is made for the compact cameras by Nauticam. By having this in front, now, on full zoom, yeah, look, I'm at 40 cm. I can come and shoot the nudie branch. that close <laughs> yeah so having diopters it's not about making things look bigger that's not the first important point the important point is by having a diopter it lets you come in even when you've zoomed your camera all the way so if you are wanting to take little little stuff your camera can't do it you need these things to help you to get closer and give you a certain level of magnification. There's no point zooming it all the way in and moving back, or zooming it all the way out and moving in. If that's not enough, then you get one of these to get the extremely small things. And you um, can take this on and off yes. in the water? Underwater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't connect to the camera, it connects to the housing. So you can be shooting a Manta, and then you see a nudie branch, and then you pull back the zoom, put on the macro, the diopter, and go for the nudie branch. Then a whale shark, then take it off and go for a whale shark. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, those who do underwater photography know they are flips. So you got the flips to flip down for macro and then, oh, Manta, flip it up and then shoot the Manta and then flip it back down. I mean, it gives you so much versatility as compared to using yeah. a 100mm shooting nudie branch and suddenly there's a whale shark mating with a Manta. <laughs> you cannot, you will go back and you will tell people, I saw a whale shark mating with a Manta, nobody will believe you. Nope. <laughs> so the compacts give you this versatility. Now, this is using a compact camera that allows you to actually control a lot. I would like to show you the toys. When people tell me about using a Olympus TG, I tell them this is a, this is a toy. It's nice to use, but it, you, you, you are not able to control the aperture or the shutter speed as with a real camera. But a camera like this, it has these modes, look. It's got underwater mode, it's got the microscope mode, it's got the scene mode, which is, of course, very easy. You can shoot people, shoot nights, shoot scenery, or you can change it to auto, where it does auto. Program works the same way. You tell the camera what exposure value you want, see? Exposure value, and he will choose everything for you. Then there's an A mode, which is a option A, B, or C. Very simple. When you click, you can use F9, you can use 3.2, or you can use 2.3, A, B, or C only. And then you've got the microscope. So this microscope mode, I can zoom my camera all the way in. Yeah? That's zoomed in and fully. Now I've got my phone here, and I can put the camera flat down on my phone. Flat. And the camera... Let me find some words, yeah? No way. <laughs> Jeez. So the TGs are amazing. They're so simple. They shoot stuff like that. And they can do video in 4K like this, no? So these are small toys that are very nice to use underwater because at zero millimeters, it can focus, yeah? Look, I mean, have you ever seen these pixels on your, on your mobile on the phone? That's how it looks like, just using that. No diopter required. Then, on the next shot, the Benta flew over your head, so you said, okay, let's get back to P. Let's pull the zoom back out. And let's shoot the Benta, you know? The camera does everything for you. There's nothing much you need to think about. Then if you want to do the same thing with the black background, where's the new D? Eh? In the middle of the table. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so small, I didn't see it. Okay, so <laughs> if I put it on the microscope mode, microscope mode, and I zoomed it 
all the way in and then I put my ISO to let's say 100 white balance auto focus okay shooting on raw I want this to be spot okay now let's do this for extremely small isopod on top of the nudie branch exposure value minus one okay Yeah, no problem. Easy. So, having a setup like this in a original Olympus housing with one torch light, that means you don't need a diopter. You, this is just for the person who likes nice pictures to go home and show the friends after the dive trip. Yeah, you're not going to go and publish in National Geographic. <laughs> Won't happen. But this will do the job. So anyone with a small camera has no problem going out and getting amazing photos if you know what to buy and the simple techniques of how to use it. Yeah, I think this is okay. Question time. Actually, we're like six minutes over, but we oh. go a little bit longer. No, no, it's very interesting. No, no, I mean, we're interested. <laughs> it's very interesting. Um, if anyone has a question here, we can pick that up. Yeah, sure. If not, we have a lot of other questions. Yeah, um, do we have a microphone? Uh, to pass along? No trick questions, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Gerhard. Hi, and I'd hi. like to ask you whether uh, you choose uh, Olympus TG5, I think, uh, whether the Nikon W300 works the same, or do you have some experience with this? It, it has the same, it, it has a deeper depth rating with the camera alone. Yeah, it goes to 30 meters, correct? Uh, the TG goes to 15, but so far only the TG has got this microscope mode. And because of this, the versatility of shooting one end full frame and then shooting the elephant on the next frame, only this guy has this capability. So you ever would prefer the Olympus? Yes, I have to say, yes. I have nothing against Nikon, but yes, yes. <laughs> Olympus for this purpose. So, so I made the wrong choice. Uh, <laughs> it's not too late. Yeah, I have both. <laughs> question? No, just joking. Okay, anyone else has any question? I, I just have one, Tim. Um, you mentioned at the beginning the workshops that you lead. Can you tell us a little bit more, just so me and Flo can go sign up as well? Okay, I'll give you a special prize, huh? Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I do a three-day zero to, I like to believe, full comprehension in three days. In the very first day, I only work the camera and the natural light so that people are not thinking too much about settings. So they start to understand what the exposure value does. I do a lot of white balancing. And then we, we compose the shots and we make sure that the exposures are nice only by using the plus one, minus yeah. one, yeah? And then on the second day, I show them how to use a torch. Now this starts to cover the metering, whether you want the overall metering or you want a spot metering. And it also makes the apparent difference between light here or light here. Light here or light here. Now it becomes very obvious because with every move of your hand, it's changing. And then you start to say, oh, too much shadows, better come yeah. to here. Oh, I can't see the back, better move it higher. Shutter speed is too slow, I better move it closer. So day two starts to comprehend a little bit more balance. And then day three, we take out the strobes and we use the strobe. So uh, something I like to bring out, constant light works very well with the P mode. The camera will choose aperture and shutter speed for you because the light is already there. A mode, yeah. the camera will choose the speed for you because the light is there. 
If you choose, I want to use 1 over 500 of a shutter speed, when you put the light, he will change the aperture to give you your minus 1 again. Because it's there. But when you're using a strobe and you half press, the strobe is not firing at half press. So if you use aperture with the strobe, when you half press, the camera will evaluate the best setting based yeah. on this light. And then when you complete the press, boom! Suddenly he said, where did that come from? <laughs> so then you start to have problems. So when you use a strobe, then it's best to be on manual because you fully control the settings. You've turned it black, you've turned it black, and now you fire with the strobe. And if the strobe is too bright, now you tune it down and tune it up. So if you use a strobe, the right place to be is on manual. But if you're using constant light on manual, then look, constant light on manual. I chose F8 and 1 over 500 shutter speed, and it's perfect. And then I moved one inch closer. Is it still perfect? It's not, because the light has gotten brighter. Then I've moved one inch back. Is it perfect? It's not. Mm -hmm. Now it's a bit too dark because my light is too far away. So using a constant light, it's best to be on A because minus two, minus two, minus two, minus two, minus two, minus two. The camera makes one decision for you. So using constant light on manual is too bright, too dark, too bright, too dark, too bright, too dark. Uh -huh. Okay. Wow. Thanks a lot. I think this is a lot of uh, amazing insight. I think we can do like one or two questions that we have from the community. I know yes, we're a little yes, bit sure. over time, but uh, sure. we just don't care. Tony, can you put it on the, uh, on the screen? Christina is asking if I buy a compact camera, what would be the most important feature for underwater filming and photography? I think we... Um, we focus more on the photography. Sensor mm. size, resolution, or raw ability? Always sensor size. Sensor size is, is, is king. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you have a 40 megapixel. I have 108 megapixel on my China-made mobile <laughs> phone. But this does not allow me to do big pictures. If I had the old DSLRs that only had 12 megapixel but a full frame sensor, they are making billboards. Sensor, megapixel, of course sensor. Sensor is the base of how much quality you can get. Okay, okay <laughs> cool. Sam is... The bigger the better. <laughs> the bigger the better. Um, <laughs> These guys have got a tiny, tiny sensor. That's why I said this will not publish, but it's nice to go home and show the children, show your grandparents. <laughs> but this one starts to be able to publish to a certain level. This, I believe, is a one-inch sensor. The Sony's also use one-inch sensors. These are already good size sensors. Then from there, it goes up to the APS-C, and then from there, it goes up to the full frame, the 35 mm sensors. Of course, those are the best. Then APS-C also good enough, and these guys are fine. But to go down to the, the tiny, tiny sensors, these are just nice for showing pictures on Facebook. Hamdan, you have? No, the one question that I've been asked on mm. social media is, how do you sign up for your workshops? Um, you can go to Anilau Photo Academy dot dot com this is where i do my courses perfect. so people can find me there awesome yeah perfect okay cool okay last question is if i'm trying to play with my camera settings underwater mm -hmm. instead of using underwater mode where would you re recommend i should start first from everything we just spoke about <laughs> I think not we using the underwater yeah i think we like start by watching this video yeah, yeah. and then do good Okay. You start great. and end with this video. Yeah, <laughs> great. Tim, thank you uh, very Thanks much. Thanks a lot, yep. man. Thank you. Thanks a lot, man. That thank was you. A fun. Pretty this cool. is useful. We have you again here. On the weekend. On the weekend. What is this, Saturday? Yeah. Saturday. Um, we will talk about... What are we going to talk about? Um, we're going to talk about underwater competitions and uh, four points that you should consider before actually making your submission. I will talk about choosing 
how to win awards. Great. The right yeah. picture. Perfect. <laughs> okay, cool. So now um, we are making a short break and then we come back at 3.30 in half an hour with Andre Musgrove and we will talk a little bit about not only the great work that he's doing but we also talk a little bit how you actually market things like this on Instagram. Everybody is kind of in it. There's a lot of questions and he is one of the guys that does it very successfully and we're going to learn and hear a little bit about what great work is he doing and how does he make sure that people actually get to see it. See you in half an hour. Thanks, Tim. Amazing. <laughs>